request. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And boy, is there a lot of uh, hot air this afternoon. I suspect it will continue as we go forward. Take my sweater off. It's, it's clearly up to constituents or anybody that's watching to pay attention to uh, which side of this house is uh, on, on in favor of this uh, omnibus bill and where we all stand as far as what are the issues when one can stand up and brag about how wonderful it is and the next one points out all of the, uh, uh, the mistakes and the errors that are there. So uh, it, it must be quite comical for people who are uh, watching at times. So I'm, I'm glad to have a chance to, uh, to speak briefly to this omnibus legislation that's been brought into the House. I say briefly because, you know, its uh, closure has been introduced again. This is the uh, fourth bill that's been introduced since the House came back after prorogation, and we've had closure on each and every one of them. So the government's clearly in a rush. Not quite sure where, uh, but uh, I think we have to think about that as Canadians. But this continues to be the same pattern that the government has done uh, previously. We have prorogation, and then we'll have a... Then we'll have a budget, and then we'll have prorogation, and we'll have another budget. So it's the, it's the pattern of management of house business that continues to be a huge challenge in here as to how house business is dealt with. As I said, it's omnibus budget, then prorogation, and back to uh, omnibus bill, and another prorogation. And if at any point we try to go off from that particular calendar, well, somewhere or another, there'll be another closure bill. And it's, it's a very sad reality when we talk about democracy in other countries and democracy in our own country, in our own house, uh, is being shortchanged every day with the kind of closure Every motions that are put down there. But today, we're not supposed to be here talking about the past, because that should speak for itself for a lot of people who are looking at there. But let's look ahead a bit. Let's look past the government's mismanagement of the debt past the Conservatives meddling with Senate business that has consumed everything going on in the House uh, for, for several weeks now and clearly is going to continue on, and past the fact that the government continues to ignore the plights of the middle class Canadians. So today I'll talk a little bit about this budget. This ominous budget had its genesis somewhere deep within that 7,000 hollow words and empty platitudes of what was called a throne speech, a speech that some have called the longest and most inherent, incoherent piece of government rhetoric in living memory. It clearly was that. It was at least a half an hour too long. But indeed, the Prime Minister spun quite a fiscal yard into that throne speech, a tale that his Minister of Finance continues into this omnibus budget. As an example, Prime Minister would have us believe that he saw the recession of 2008 looming on the horizon. Well, this is really odd. Because in the campaign of 2008, the Prime Minister said the recession would never happen. Guaranteed Canadians will never have a recession then. And attacked those warning Canadians to batten down the hatches as fear-mongering. Well, we've seen where that went. Well, indeed, Canada could have been better prepared had this Prime Minister actually listened to those of us in the Liberal Party who were sounding the alarm. But as usual, the Prime Minister listened only to himself or those in PMO. This budget is a continuation of this closed-minded and confused fiscal management theory that the Conservatives continue to put ahead. This budget is again projecting a significant deficit. But just so people don't forget, remember seven years ago, this government, when it got into office, inherited a decade of balanced budgets, hmm. annual surpluses of $13 billion, declining okay. debt, declining taxes, strong economic growth exceeding 3% annually, 3.5 million net new jobs, and the most robust fiscal situation in the world. Ideal, perfect position for them to come in. But despite all of this, this Conservative budget is another example of failures. Besides dealing with the fiscal matters, like the Supreme Court appointment process, which has been completely bungled, this budget does little more than remind Canadians that the Conservatives have overspent by three times the rate of inflation. Conservatives have eliminated the contingency reserves that Liberals had built into the federal budget process to protect Canadians against unexpected and adverse events. We have clearly very little protection built in anywhere today should there be a major problem for Canada. But most importantly, this government sent the surplus up in smoke and put Canada back into deep deficit long before, and that's the key word, 
long before the onset of the recession that the Prime Minister's economic wisdom said was never going to happen. Now, as ridiculous as that sounds, you just have to clearly read the books and read the blues and you'll see how it is. So despite all of that looming evidence, evidence that almost every Canadian detected ahead of time, the Prime Minister continued with his denials. Despite collapsing markets in the U.S. and the onset of American bank failures, this Prime Minister continued to blindly plunge ahead. So rather than positioning Canada for the recession in advance, this Prime Minister suggested that economic problems in other countries would be a good thing for Canada. Remember how he projected good buying opportunities when other countries are in trouble. Well, I'm not sure if this was deceptive or just clueless. Canadians will be the ultimate judge of this ineptitude, but this country was left vulnerable, and this budget is further proof of just how seriously that exposure was. So this brings us back to the omnibus budget that is before us today. After six conservative deficits and nearly $180 billion in new conservative debt, this minister has the audacity to suggest that his debt to GDP target of 25% by the year 2021 is bold. And worse still is the extreme hypocrisy of a government that took Canada from its largest surplus in history to the largest deficit in history, promising balanced budget legislation. In my estimation, deficit spending should be viewed as a tax on future generations and politicians who create deficits should be exposed as the tax hikers that they truly are. That's right. So remember, the government deficit is the difference between the amount of money that the government spends and the amount it has the nerve to collect. So it's odd to hear this particular promise from this particular Prime Minister's mouth because in the past 17 years, he is the only Prime Minister to permit a deficit. He is the only Prime Minister to hike the national debt. So the real story here is that the omnibus bill is an admission of the Conservative government's failure and ineptitude as fiscal managers. So let us not forget that it was this Prime Minister that promised to attain a debt-to-GDP target of 25% by the year 2012. So when they missed that target, they began planning, and now they have made the same kind of promise again, only this time they're promising to do it by 2021. <laughs> So Conservatives can promise and then re-promise the same things over and over, but the promises are not credible. This budget makes promises and commitments, but the promises are not ground in sound fiscal policies, and they are certainly not in the best interest of the middle class. The Conservatives think they can slash their way to prosperity, but the past seven years has proven they only dig a deeper hole. So sadly, this hole now contains the Conservative cuts to old age pensions, to health care plans, to environmental projects, but prosperity still eludes the government. So there's an old saying that suggests the first thing you do when you find yourself in a hole is to stop digging. Well, budget 2013 is nothing more than a shovel and will yield the same results as its predecessors advanced under the failed conservative fiscal ideology. In every year since 2010, economic growth in Canada has been slower than the year before. No Prime Minister has done worse since the days of R.B. Bennett. So what Canada needs most, alongside strong, competent, honest government, is a concrete plan for greater sustained economic growth, focused on the middle class. As the voice of the people of York West, I'm truly saddened by this government's negligence and disregard for middle class families, students, seniors and those working to make a living. Canadians are already being hurt by the fiscal policies of this government, and this omnibus bill is just another swipe at the middle class. I cannot support it. Clearly, it would be a good idea if the Conservatives didn't support it either. Thank yeah, you very yeah. much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to share with my, uh, my uh, thank my colleague for. for uh, for bringing her views forward. I want to share with her something that's happening at the uh, Department of National Defense. Uh, a veteran today, which was a member of the forces last week, uh, Corporal uh, Hawkins, um, he was suffering for, from post-traumatic stress disorder. He had one year to, uh, to finish his, his, his 10 years in order to get a pension. And I do remember the Minister of Defense last year saying no member of the forces will be, uh, would be pushed out yet, last week. 
Last Friday, he was giving his marching orders. He had to push out. And therefore, I'm just wondering if my colleague can, can share with us how she sees the shortcomings of this government and the failed promises of the Minister of Defense as yet this veteran, the soldier of yesterday, was pushed out of the forces and not allowed to finish his 10 years. The Honourable Member for York West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to begin by congratulating my colleague um, on his new critic role as veterans. Uh, we've been very fortunate that we've had some great members do some fabulous work on the veterans file. And uh, as his predecessor before him, uh, my current colleague, uh, does a great job. These issues that we keep hearing about our veterans, you know, it's so nice to be able to stand up and talk about all the wonderful things we're doing for them. And it's that rhetoric that we continue to hear from an awful lot of people. But when we actually get out there and talk to some of the veterans, and I have a, a young man in our riding that um, did 20 years in Bosnia and is now suffering with PTSD and, and has been turned down several times and we've launched an appeal to try to get the proper support for the men and women that put a uniform on to defend our country and put their lives at stake. And they get very frustrated with hearing all of their rhetoric about all the things they're going to be doing, but yet when they go and reach out for the help that they need, the doors are always shut. Uh, questions and comments? Castillo uh, and Comente, the on the Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, thank you. Mr. Speaker, I know um, in the last number of months, one of the strongest advocates in terms of uh, seniors that are on pensions has been my colleague uh, from, from Toronto, as she has uh, taken a look at the issue of how this government has increased the age of retirement from 65 to 67. And I know she's had the opportunity to tell the House on previous occasions the impact that that is going to have. And I'm wondering if she could share with members once again her thoughts in regards to the impact of increasing the age of retirement uh, from 65 to 67. The Honourable Member for York West. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, let me, uh, let me begin by saying that um, uh, we intend to do a good job on this side of the House, and uh, I would expect that uh, going to 67, the only way that that's going to change is if, if Canadians were to be uh, deluded enough to uh, re-elect a Conservative government. Under the Liberals and in our future, 65 is an ideal age. I have countless people in my riding and throughout this country, they don't even make it to 65, because the kind of work that they had to do in construction and difficult jobs and bad health they don't make it to 65 to get their pension. They're at 55 already and unable to work because of various injuries and so on. And they're looking for assistance. So the idea that everybody wants to work to 67, 70 or 72 or whatever, God bless them all if they want to. They want to pay the additional taxes because you know, just to say governments can always use it. But an awful lot of people never get to be 65 because they can't wait, never mind 67. So on this side of the house, as far as the Liberals, if we have an opportunity, and when we have an opportunity to form government, that age will stay at 65. Here, here. Uh, the time.